My Seven Chakras, episode one seventy three. Adopt the pace of nature. Her secret is patience. The seven chakras, swirling vortices of energy, positioned throughout our body from the base of the spine to the crown of the head. For thousands of years, this ancient wisdom has been passed on from master to disciple. What are the functions of these energy centers, and could these chakras help you unlock your destiny and find your true purpose? Welcome to my seven chakras, and now your host, Aditya Jai Kumar. Kumar. What's up, Action Tribe? AJ here, founder and host of My 7 Chakras, the show where we dive deep into the ancient world to uncover nuggets of wisdom that will change your life. Now, this is your show where we believe that science and spirit go hand in hand to take on challenges that we cannot overcome just by ourselves. Challenges that help us evolve to a whole new level. So if this is the first time that you're listening to the show, I want to assure you that this is no coincidence. You are here for a reason. So welcome to My 7 Chakras. Action takers, in today's show, we're going to learn about healing through foods with Andrea Beeman. But before that, I'm going to read out to you our latest iTunes review. So today's review is by Linda who writes, I enjoy the concept of this podcast using knowledge and experience-based teachings to convey ancient and modern tools. The tools given to the audience of this podcast are so important, especially in today's day and age. Also, the host has a great way of conveying what the guests have to say. I love that Aditya does this for the greater good and unites us all action takers. Whether you are into yoga, meditation, or just spirituality as a concept, this podcast channel has so much to offer offer. Thank you for your open heart and devotion to your listeners. Peace. Action Tribe, producing this podcast takes up a lot of my time, but receiving even one review makes me feel like my work is transforming life. So if you want your review to be read out, make sure you leave us your thoughts, your views, your feedback in the form of an iTunes review. There are two ways you can do it. If you're on your iPhone already, just hit review and then hit write a review. You can also type in the link onto your browser to jump directly onto the iTunes review page. The link is my 7 forward slash review. That's my 7 forward slash review. Once again, reviews help us get more exposure and attract more action takers just like yourself. And with that, we are now ready to welcome our very special guest for today, Andrea Beeman. So Andrea, are you ready to inspire? I am ready to inspire, AJ. That is wonderful. So Andrea Beeman is a natural foods chef, health educator, thyroid expert, and holistic health coach dedicated to alternative healing and sustainable eating and living. Andrea was a featured contestant on Bravo's Top Chef. She is a regularly featured food and health expert on CBS News and hosts the award-nominated Fed Up, a cooking show that educates viewers how to cook for and cure their bodily ailments. Andrea is recognized as one of the top 100 most influential people in health and fitness for greatest.com, received the award for excellence in health supportive food education from the National Gourmet Institute for Food and Health, as well as the Health Leadership Award from the Institute for Integrative Nutrition. So, Andrea, welcome to My 7 Chakras. Before we begin, help our listeners get to know a bit more about you and your story. Uh, well, you know, it's an interesting story. <laughs> At least I think so. Um, I was uh, diagnosed with a thyroid condition when I was a young kid. I was like 28 years old and I had a large goiter. And um, my doctors had recommended radioactive iodine to destroy my thyroid and then be on medication for the rest of my life. And I said, no, AJ. I said, uh, I know that my diet is not good and I know that my lifestyle is really crappy and I need to take care of myself. And uh, my doctor said, listen, your diet and your lifestyle have nothing to do with your disease. And I said, okay, well, I get that that's what you've been taught, but I have a different understanding. Mm -hmm. And I changed my diet and my lifestyle, and I actually healed my condition. And that was almost 20 years ago. Actually, it was 20 years ago, exactly. (laughs) And I've been teaching people ever since, you know, that we really got to take care of ourselves and eat well and love ourselves and nourish ourselves on a really deep level. You know, it's it's part of um, how you can live happily and healthfully here on the planet. Awesome. So when you replied to the doctor, what was that thing within you 
that made you confident that, you know, there's some answer out there? Was it someone that spoke to you or did you read a book? Well, it was actually years prior, I had watched my mom go through the treatments of breast cancer in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. She had something called a radical mastectomy. And at that time, AJ, they took off the entire breast, all the lymph nodes and all the skin on that, you know, where the, bre uh, where the cancer was. And after five years, they said, okay, you know, she's cancer free. But unfortunately, 11 years later, the breast cancer came back, even though the breast was no longer there and the lymph nodes were no longer there, except now the cancer was in her brain, it was in her lungs, it was in her liver, it was in her bones, it was everywhere. So we did, we followed the modern protocol again, and we went to chemotherapy and radiation and, and once again started that whole process. Mm -hmm. And my dad had read a book about a doctor that had healed his pancreatic cancer using diet and lifestyle. And he said, you know what? He said, let's try this with mom. And I said, okay, that sounds great. So we did. We tried changing our diet using, um, at the time, it was like, you know, 20 years ago, actually like 25 years ago. It was called macrobiotics. And it was like natural foods and whole foods. So we tried that with my mom. And I noticed that her energy levels did change with the food that we gave her. And I also noticed that when I ate that food, my energy levels changed. And it wasn't, unfortunately, it wasn't enough to bring my mom back. After a year and a half, she passed away. But it planted in me a seed of knowledge mm -hmm. that if something happens to me, that I'm going to try a natural, more holistic route first before destroying my body in some way. And so that's what I did. I mean, it was, it came from a life experience and this intuitive knowledge that, hey, there's something about eating well and taking care of the body that really resonates with me on a deep level. Wonderful. Thanks a lot for sharing that story with us. Now, as always, let's begin with some inspiration. Andrea, what is your favorite inspirational quote and how do you apply this quote in your life? AJ, my gosh, there are so many inspirational quotes. I, I could quote like a thousand of them. <laughs> but one of my favorites is from Ralph Waldo Emerson. And he was a, an American uh, philosopher. And he said, adopt the pace of nature. Her secret is patience. And one of the reasons why that resonates with me is because in our modern technology, in our modern world, everything is moving so fast. And we're going at warp speed, but we're actually not designed for that. You know, our physical bodies are, are not designed to... Uh, move at the speed of light. There are other parts of us that move at the speed of light, maybe our emotions, our spiritual body, but the physical body, unfortunately, you know, we, we're dense with matter. So we move slowly and we forget that. So in the modern world, it's like, oh, you're sick. Okay, take the breast off. Oh, 15 feet of your intestines. Shoot, let's take that out of there. Uh, gallbladder, gone, goodbye. Uh, lung, you know, cut off piece of the lung. Let's take a kidney out, right? We're very quick to pull piece, pieces of the body out. But we forget that that illness may have taken a long time to manifest. Nobody just wakes up one day and boom, there they have it. A disease, they have cancer, they have gallbladder problems, they have digestive stuff. It's not the way that it works. That happens over time. And we forget that. So... The fact that the disease takes a long time to develop also means that it takes time to heal. The disease is not going to heal after one magical cup of soup or one little bit of turmeric into your food. That's not the way that it works. It takes patience. It takes practice and persistence. And that's how we can heal our illnesses that, that we're bombarded with in this modern world. So Action Tribe, a flower is in no hurry to bloom. A tree is in no hurry to shed its leaves in autumn and a mountain is in no hurry to receive its snow so why you so it's time to adopt the pace of nature as andrea suggests it's time to adopt some patience so with that let's dive in what inspired you to write your book the whole truth uh, well, what inspired me was that I had to start to speak, you know, and, and your podcast is called The Seven Chakras. So for me, it was the fifth chakra. That's where my illness was. It manifested in my throat. I had a large goiter. I had hyperthyroid. And that is the area where we can express ourselves and we can express our truth and express 
to, with grace and wisdom. And when I healed myself naturally, I said, oh my gosh, I have to share this information with the world. So what inspired me to write the book was literally energizing that fifth chakra and being able to speak a truth that I wasn't hearing in the world or that I didn't have access to in the world today. You know, because like I, that was, I wrote my first book that was in 2005, that was 11 years ago. So you know, healing the thyroid wasn't on people's radar. <laughs> it was, uh, you know, let's read, you know, take it out, radiate it, thyroidectomy, all, all that stuff. So for me, part of my healing was to actually speak and share the truth of what I learned. And my truth is different from your truth and someone else's truth or the doctor's truth, but it is a truth and I had to share it. So that's where the inspiration came from. Wonderful. So I love that you said that you had to start speaking about healing your fifth chakra that is responsible for expressing your voice both literally and symbolically, mm-hmm. right? So let's talk about the challenge at hand based on your experience. What's wrong with the food that we eat today? Well, once again, we're looking at um, very fast production of food. So, you know, like uh, we're trying to feed millions and millions of people and very fast and it's it's not healthy. Like we're, we're missing all of the ancient the ancient principles and preparation techniques and and everything that went into preparing food. So like if you look at the food today, there's mass quantities of foods on the shelves and they're packaged and they have tons of preservatives and genetically modified ingredients and and this stuff that we're literally not designed to process that quickly. So when we're eating these highly refined highly processed foods, our body's having a physical reaction. So not only the food that we're eating that's filled with all of this crap, and I, you know, I, I say crap because that's what it is. It's chemicals. It's, you know, everything that if I, I'm a firm believer that if you can't pronounce it, you can't digest it. And if you can read, <laughs> right, you read all the yeah. ingredients that are on those packaged foods, you can't pronounce half of them. So not only that, but again, we're looking at our pace, right? So we have all of this food that is designed, processed so quickly and put into the food supply and put in all, all of these chemicals and then we're eating on the run. We're not even sitting down with our families anymore, which was, you know, that's, that's a part of healing is to sit down, be in, in a community with your family, enjoying a meal that was probably home prepared, lovingly prepared, which is an essential ingredient that's missing from the factories, right? The robots are not putting the love into the ingredients, whereas you great grandma or your grandma would infuse her energy into the ingredients, which was love, you know, because I'm a, I'm a big believer in energy that we're all little blobs of energy here on this planet and everything that we touch and everything, uh, one that we're connected to. So the process of eating our food, gathering our food, preparing our food, sitting with our loved ones and the quality of our food, that is all completely shifted in the past 100 years. So there's no, for me, it's it's not really a mystery why so many people are developing so many diseases. It's really not. It's um, it's just a part of, of what we're creating here in the world. So a couple of really interesting things that you spoke about. You spoke about the fact that food production has increased in pace over the last couple of years. You spoke about the fact that we're missing out on certain ancient preparation techniques. There's so much GMO in the food processed foods, chemicals of the food, and all of that leads to some bodily reaction and ultimately to the issue at hand. And you also spoke about something really, really fascinating, the fact that a real meal, a nutritious meal, is not only about what it contains, but also about the love that it creates and the people that it connects at the dinner table, right? So that's uh, that's really interesting. Now, diving a bit deeper, Could you talk to us about the relationship between what we eat and our energy levels throughout the day? Yeah. So again, here we have this highly processed food, right? So it's going to have a very quick action in the body. So if I opt for a coffee and a donut for breakfast, right, which is caffeine and sugar and a donut, which is more sugar and lots of carbohydrates, I'm going to get a very quick burst of energy and it's going to spike my insulin levels. Insulin's going to have to push that sugar into the cells and that's going to have to give us the energy that we need. But then what's going to happen after that is probably a crash where we're going to crash an hour later or two hours later. We're going to be un, you know, unable to focus. The brain is not going to function well and we're going to be reaching out for more quick stimulants. So part of the, the problem is that we're, it's, it sets the body up 
for failure. It'll set us up in the long term for diabetes, uh, for adrenal fatigue, you know, other endocrine imbalances, because the body's really not designed to have that quick, 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 quick hit, you know, over and over and over and over and over again. You know, we're we're, we're not going to last. We need a little more duration. We need a little more longevity. So like a really relaxed, nourishing breakfast is not the norm anymore for most people. It's really quick, got to go, got to get up, got to get out of the house, get something on the run, shove it into your face, keep going, right? And then sit down at the desk and then coffee all day Mm. long or some Mm. type of stimulant all day long. And it's going to burn ourselves out. So if we're designed to live for, you know, maybe 80 or 100 years, maybe 125 is, you know, what the old, old people used to say, right? We're designed to have this longer experience at a gentler pace. If we burn ourselves out too quickly, we won't get that pace. We won't get that duration, that longevity that we're actually designed for. Um, you know, it'll literally be, be like quick in, quick out, and boom, done, you're out of here. Got it. Okay, so you spoke about the fact that a lot of people have coffee and donut for breakfast. And that leads to a quick burst of energy, but then they experience a crash. And then somewhere in the afternoon, they get more stimulants, but then there's another crash as well. Now, you also mentioned that that leads to some other issues, right? Like diabetes or some other endocrine related challenges. Now, let's talk about the person who is having coffee or donut for breakfast, right? They're doing it for a particular reason to be able to get that energy or to get that focus early in the morning. So, What do they have instead to get that same level of energy? Is there an alternative? Oh, there's lots of alternatives. You know, like, let's start to look at some traditional foods that people had for breakfast. So, like, you know, here in the States, a traditional breakfast might have been, like, slow-cooked oats or some Mm -hmm. porridge from the night before. Um, In a lot of European countries, they would have, like, a soup for breakfast. I know in Japan and China, soup or some type of congee. For breakfast was traditional. You know, I don't know what what was eaten in India, but I'm thinking probably dal and maybe, you know, some type of uh, uh, bread or lentils or something like that. But we've definitely changed. We've changed. Mm -hmm. We're not having those more nourishing meals that we used to have. You know, also in in a lot of the countries, there were like eggs for breakfast, you know, like some type of uh, poached eggs, even on sourdough bread. This is a much more nourishing breakfast than donuts and coffee. So what we don't have time, like most people, they're like just rushing out the door to get to the office and they neglect themselves first thing in the morning. And I think that this is a very terrible thing to do. I think that the first thing in the morning, one of the greatest things that you can do for yourself is to just relax, sit down, have a nourishing meal, look back into your traditions and not even your grandparents, but look back into your great grandparents. What were they having for breakfast traditionally? What were they sitting down to in the morning before they started their day? Because they had energy to last throughout the entire day. So what were they eating? So this is going to change all year round, and it's going to change in every country around the world. So what people were eating in Canada and Mexico and South America and Africa and India and Argentina, right, all around the world, people were having breakfast, and it was indigenous to where they were. So my breakfast here in America is different than somebody's breakfast in Russia. Mm -hmm. Mm. Now, as a holistic health coach, you use visual and meridian diagnosis, right? So what exactly is that? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, that's that's ancient um, oriental medicine, so Japanese and Chinese medicine. So okay. that is literally looking at the outside of the body and the energetic of the body and seeing what's happening inside. So, for example, today in modern medicine... We have great technology. We can look into the body with a blood test and with an x-ray, and we can see that there may be masses. We can see the blood may not be functioning well, but what they don't see is the energetic body. So in Ayurvedic medicine, there are the chakras, which are an energetic body, which you can't see with a blood test, and you can't see with with an x-ray. The same thing with the meridians. The meridians are the energetic pathways in Chinese medicine. You cannot see them with an x-ray. But when the meridians, these energetic pathways in the body, when they're blocked, there'll be possibly discolorations coming up to the surface of the body. So I'll give a great example. If the kidney meridian, right, if the kidney organs, the kidney and the bladder, which are a complementary organ system, if they are too cold, 
or they are not functioning well, there may be purple colors that arise around the body. And mm -hmm. the purple color will indicate an internal cold. So sometimes a lot of people will see this around the eyes. You could see it in the, in the face. You could see it in the lips. Let, let's think about when someone is cold, for example, all over cold, uh, they'll get purple fingertips, which is showing that the blood is not moving. They'll get purple lips, which is showing that the blood in the digestive system is not moving, right? Because the lips are connected to the digestive system. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm using the purple color and the kidneys as an example. Another great example is the heart, right? So the heart is considered the fire energy in the body. And when someone has an overactive heart, generally there'll be this red color that comes up to the face or the red color that comes to the heart. So you don't need to have an x-ray, right? Or an, uh, what do they get? A cardiogram to sh see, see that the heart is out of balance. You'll look at the person's face and you'll say, my gosh, this person internally is on fire. Their heart element is out of balance. We need to cool them down. So if somebody's heart fire, their heart element is out of balance, We wa you want to give them Lots of salads, lots of cooling foods, watermelon, something that's going to cool that system down. We're on the opposite side. If someone is too cold, if the kidney element is too cool and it's and they're in the purple state, right? Purples and blues, which are cold colors. You want to heat that person up. Give them rosemary. Give them warm soups and stocks. Give them more ginger, right? Something that's going to bring some fire into the body. So that's part of visual diagnosis. It's really looking at the person energetically and on the physical body and saying, okay, what's going on with them? Where are they out of balance? You know, because mm -hmm. a lot of that stuff is not going to show up on a blood test. It's not going to show up on an x-ray, but it'll show up literally in their energetic field and on their physical body externally. You could see what's happening internally. Interesting, because you, you mentioned that the discoloration towards purple yeah you know on the face and body uh, that's quite interesting because recently my acupuncturist told me that my tongue is a bit purple oh. so i literally not, noted down some of the foods that you recommended to take in order to move from the cold to the warm and hot yes. <laughs> so i'm yes. going to try that out for sure yeah, a purple tongue indicates that there's blood stagnation, that the blood needs warmth, it needs to move. So definitely put in some warming, moving, blood-moving herbs or foods, garlic, ginger, uh, more warming stocks, warming soups, like that kind of stuff. Got it. So moving on, I know that you recently conducted a workshop where you taught people cooking and nutrition skills to help prevent the three major causes of death and disease in America – Health diseases, yes. cancer, and stroke. Now, I know that we don't have all the time to get into the details, but could you provide us an overview of the relationship between food and these diseases? Oh, absolutely. So like the top three killers uh, in America, but also around the world, is heart disease, cancer, and stroke. So first we have to look at the physical body and say, okay, heart disease is an inflamed condition in the body. The blood is not functioning well. Same thing with stroke because heart disease and stroke are the same disease in separate parts of the body, right? The stroke is in the, in the mind, in the brain, and uh, heart disease is happening in the cardiovascular system, right? So then you also have cancer. Now, when we look at these three, we say, okay, with heart disease and stroke, you have a blood supply that's not functioning properly. It's not moving properly or it's inflamed so what can we do well we need more cooling foods we need foods that are going to move the blood not stagnate the blood and also we need stuff that's going to support the cardiovascular system so you want you don't want congesting foods right things so a lot of the stuff that we're eating is congesting the body so like if you look around the world and you look at the the amount of fast food that people are eating Right here we come to this fast again, right? So I talked about Emerson saying adopt the pace of nature. Her secret is patience. Fast food is not patient at all. So we have this fast food. It's high fat, high sugar that congests the body. It congests the cardiovascular system. It congests the lymphatic system. That's going to contribute to heart disease and stroke as well as cancer because if the lymph isn't moving, you're not moving the debris out of the body. So 
With cancer, which is very interesting because one out of three people now, right, which is very high, Mm -hmm. one out of three people are being diagnosed with cancer. This is a crime against humanity. It's showing that not only is our lymphatic system not taking the debris out, but our detoxification systems like the, the, the liver and the kidneys as well as the colon are not functioning properly as well. So within... And cancer is such a big topic, so I'm just going to touch on it lightly here. So within the detoxification systems, we have to look and say, well, why is the system not functioning properly? And what's happening with the cells? Because with the cells, cells are born and cells are die. They die every single day, every single moment of every day. You have a cell birth and you have a cell death. Yeah. With cancer, there's no cell death. So what is stopping the death of a cell? What is stopping that apoptosis of a cell? And again, we have to look into our food supply. In our food supply that we have, we have food that does not break down. It's loaded with preservatives that stop the death process, which is the worst thing that you can put into your body because you actually want food to break down and you want it to die. You do not want bread that's going to be able to last for for five weeks without Uh going moldy. Right, You actually want that bread or the food that you're eating to have a death process because if it doesn't, again, the, the stuff that's loaded up with the preservatives that does not break down, this is one of the things that can contribute directly to cancer because everything that we eat is going to have that energetic effect. Right, So if the food that we're eating does not break down, that's going to happen in our, in our cells. Our cells are going to lose that ability to break down as well. So, you know, one of the things that I was telling the students in the class is the first and foremost for all three of these conditions, heart disease, cancer, and stroke, you've got to get off the fast food, the preservatives, and you've got to get back into natural foods. So natural foods, wholesome foods, direct from the earth, right from the farm, right from your garden, right? Food that has a life process. These are the things that you want in your body, the most natural foods possible. And I know, so a lot of people tell me that they don't have time to take care of themselves. And I always encourage them that this is the, what they, where they have to make the time. They have to put themselves back into their life. They have to make the time for this. Otherwise, they're going to lose time, meaning they're going to lose time in their life, right? Because all we have in life and time is time. That's it. We have whatever time we have here, whether it's going to be 60 years, 70 years, 80 years, 90 years. So make sure that you're really ensuring that your time here is so important. Your time here is precious. So put yourself first and start to make some of these uh, changes in your food supply. So Andrea, what would you describe as a healthy meal for the day, starting from breakfast all the way till dinner? Oh, AJ, well, like I said, it's going to change as for all over the world, right? So, and also in each season. So I'll give you some examples. I live in the Northeastern United States. And in the wintertime, I love having soup for breakfast. Uh, I love like miso soup with a little piece of salmon and some uh, shiitake mushrooms and scallions and some roots, you know, especially roots in the mm-hmm. wintertime, like carrots or daikon. I also like a little bit of oatmeal with cinnamon, goji berries. Sometimes I put some ginger in there, a little bit of butter or ghee. And then uh, sometimes I like, uh, you know, like in the, let's, let's look at the opposite of that in the summertime. In the morning, sometimes I just like a, a nice bowl of watermelon, <laughs> right? If it's, if it's 95 <laughs> yeah. degrees, <laughs> I just want a peach in the morning or something like that. Uh, so it's going to change all year round. So right now we're moving into fall and then going into winter. And so for I'm craving more warming foods in the morning. I'm craving more soups. I'm craving more porridges. I'm craving a little less eggs. Uh, I, I, sure. Yeah, I crave more eggs in the spring and in the summer. Um, I'm craving a little less eggs and a little more porridgey kind of stuff. Because for me, that's actually more warming and more, uh, it just sticks in my body a little longer. So all of that sounds really tasty. But what really uh, stood out for me was that you are actually following your cravings. Yes. But cravings that lead you to healthy food. So that's really, really amazing. Now, we spoke about food. How do herbs fit into the picture? What's the role of herbs in our overall health and well-being? Well, herbs have been used for thousands of years by cultures around the world. I mean, throughout history. 
all over the world, every single culture has been using herbs. And something happened, it was in the 15th century where, uh, you know, like people were destroyed for using herbs. You know, like we have the whole witch trials and the witches that mm-hmm. burned and, and they were called heathens because they were using these you know, saying, okay, well, use this herb from the earth. And everybody was like, no, it's from God. There was like this separation, (laughs) right? (laughs) Separation between like God and the earth. And it became crazy time, right? The dark ages literally were dark ages. And, um, and we stopped using herbs or were afraid to use herbs. But now they're making a huge comeback over the past 40 years. And um, they're very important because they're concentrated vegetables, right? And constant, you know, mm-hmm. like they're roots and barks and berries and, and all of these foods, and they are foods, uh, you know, like if you look around the world, they're foods that were used in culinary and for healing purposes throughout time since since we've been cooking food so i I look at something like turmeric like now we're extracting the constituents and um people are saying oh just put turmeric on this and that and they're putting turmeric on everything but turmeric was traditionally eaten with food and with pepper right so it had more bioavailability the same thing with like rosemary rosemary i just had um a student say to me that they were in italy and the uh the, the Italians, the ones who were like 100 years old, they were putting rosemary in everything, right? Rosemary in their breakfast, rosemary in their lunch, rosemary. They had rosemary in olive oil. And we know today, scientifically, that rosemary can enhance circulatory uh, stimulation. In the German pharmacopoeia, rosemary oil was used to stimulate and bring blood to the heart. They're now experimenting on using rosemary for brain health, but traditionally it was just put into food. They just put it into food and it ensured that the blood was going to move and go to where it needed to go. So I think herbs are essential. And and like I said, we use barks, roots, berries, uh, flowers. All of this is considered herbs, herbs and spices. That's wonderful. Now, We've spoken about energy levels a short while back, but from a nutrition standpoint, what should a person keep in mind in order to have high levels of energy, even in the evenings, and not fatigue? Uh, well, uh, first, we have to look at evening time as a time to slow down, right? So mm-hmm. everything slows down. If you look out into nature, as the sun starts setting, everything kind of slows down. I mean, there are some nocturnal a- animals that, that get energized at night, but the majority of human beings... I'd have to say all human beings are <laughs> are more daytime. We're daytime creatures. So we okay. have to follow, uh, well, what's happening with the other daytime creatures? What do they do at night? Well, they start to gather together and go into their little holes and their caves and their nests and wherever they go, and they settle in. But unfortunately, again, AJ, we are on this 24-hour cycle of go, 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 and we're wiping ourselves out. We're exhausting ourselves, and it's not healthy. But one of the ways that we can keep our energy up during the day is to eat a balanced breakfast, start the day. Well, first, don't start the day immediately with food, right? Not physical food. Uh, One of the greatest things that I could inspire people or hope to inspire people to do is in the morning, start the day with conscious breathing and opening up their energetic body. And so that includes traditional practices. So for me, I do a combination in the morning of I wake up, I do breathing. Sometimes I'll do 15 minutes of yoga to open up my chakras. Sometimes I'll do 15 minutes of meridian stretches to open up and energize my organs and my meridians. And what I'm doing in the morning is I am opening up my energy body to receive the energy from the earth and from the universe and from everything around me before I put food into my physical body. Because food is another form of energy, but I need to gather the other energy from the universe before I start to put food in. Like we are so connected to food that most of us think that we there's no way that we could ever start the day without food. And I'm going to suggest that people start to rethink that. Rethink that and start the day energizing yourself and energizing your chakras, your meridians, your organs with the other forms of energy that are available to us the way that the ancient sages did through breathing, through meditation, through movement, gentle movement. I'm not going to tell you to run a marathon. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Right, on, <laughs> six miles on a you know on a pee pee pot. Although you can do it, um, yeah. but 
certainly start to tap into the other forms of energy that we have access to that we have not been utilizing. And then sit down and eat your breakfast. Action Tribe, for today's show notes, visit my 7 forward slash 173. That's my 7 forward slash 173. Challenge is a dragon with the gift in its mouth. Tame the dragon and the gift is yours. Now, this is an amazing quote by Noella Evans, Action Tribe. Not all dragons are bad. I'm not talking about the cute little dragon here. I'm talking about a large, dangerous, fire-spitting dragon that represents a challenge that has come to attack you from nowhere. Don't run away from it. Don't hide from it. And don't find ways to numb the pain. Instead, learn more about your challenge as we're learning today. Find the root cause of why it's there in the first place. Because if you take the time and effort to do so, you will effectively tame your dragon and also know how to handle other dragons who might appear in the future. And ultimately, the gift of health, the gift of happiness or love or fulfillment will be yours. So Andrea, on the topic of challenges, when was the last time you experienced a major challenge in your life? Also tell us what steps you took to overcome that challenge. Well, the challenges happen all the time. You know, like... For me, my first challenge was watching my mom die with um, the breast cancer and the treatments of that. That was a huge challenge, and it questioned my whole uh, connection to the universe and to God. At that time, I was, you know, after my mom died, I became an atheist, right? I I had no belief in God. (laughs) I was like, there is no God. You could take a person like this from the planet. There is no God. So that was a challenge. And then my own illness brought me back. It brought me back to... Okay, self-care, self-love, understanding. What did I learn from my mother's condition? Uh, It brought me back to uh, really trying to take this on. Why am I getting this disease? Why did this come to me at this time in my life? What is the bigger picture? What What can I learn from this? And that was one of the greatest challenges for me was to take on my health and to really try to understand it from a deeper perspective. And it actually brought me closer to uh, what I call the universe, right? Some people call it God or, you know, some, you know, I... Allah, I, you know, I don't know. I don't know what, what other people call it, but I call it the universe. And it's just like, what am I doing here on the planet as a human being? And what is my purpose? What is my purpose on the planet? And my disease gave me the challenge to figure out how do I heal this? And then from that challenge, uh, after healing it, I found my purpose, which was to teach others. Um, so I think that those challenges at least for me in my life, have been my greatest teachers, right? It's just amazing what happens when we can reflect back. Like when I'm not saying that in the thick of it, you know, I'm like, oh, thank God for this challenge. In the thick of it, I'm like, oh, my God, this is horrible, right? This totally stinks worse than anything in the whole world. But when you come out on the other side and you reflect back and you say, wow, I learned. Look at what I learned. Look at how I've grown. My gosh, my life has become so enriched from these challenges. So, you know, I I still have challenges to this day. Now, you know, 20 years in, into this, you know, I I can't say that I I live life on the planet and and sickness doesn't come. Sickness does come. And I look at my, my physical body, my emotional body, my spiritual body, and my energetic body. And I say, okay, what do I need to learn now? What do I need to look at? What is this disease telling me? What is this new challenge telling me? You know, what What can I learn from this? So uh, I think with age comes wisdom, and with each challenge, you get to learn and grow and learn and understand more about yourself. I hope I answered that question correctly. <laughs> Oh, wonderful. Uh, Thanks a lot for that response. And thanks a lot for sharing your story. What is that one major life lesson in just one sentence that you'd like to share with our listeners? One major life lesson. Um, Take on, take on your disease, whatever it is. You know, like, um, what do you have? Do you have cancer, heart disease, thyroid disease? What is that disease? And what can it possibly tell you? What can you learn from it? You know, like for me, again, my thyroid disease was teaching me that I had to learn how to express my truth and express it gracefully and with wisdom, right? So what what can your disease tell you? Where is it located in your body? Is it in the heart? Do you need to learn compassion? Is it in the adrenals? Do you need to learn how to slow down and relax, right? So um, 
I, I think that I would like to teach your listeners that, to look at their condition and say, what can I learn from this thing? So, again, thanks a lot for sharing your story. Uh, you mentioned that the biggest challenge that you've faced was watching your mom die. And at that point, you really questioned everything around you, including God. You became an atheist. And after a while, when you had your own illness, you sort of came back. You started asking questions. Your approach was different. And you took a couple of steps back to really understand what's the bigger picture over here. You try to understand the root cause of the challenge in the first place. And you also took steps to find out what was your reason for being here on this earth? What is your life's purpose? And as you shared with us, you mentioned that all of that seemed to stem from the disease in the first place. So the disease was like a teacher who guided you towards finding your calling in the midst of seemingly impossible obstacles. So that's why today you've taught us that whenever you face a challenge, Action Tribe, first try to find out where is that challenge located where is the disease located in the heart in the leg you know wherever it is try to find out what is that challenge or disease trying to tell you because there might be a, a sign or, an, or a nudge that is trying to get through you and that challenge might be actually a teacher that is guiding you towards finding your life's true calling so thanks a lot for sharing that andrea i think it was really really inspiring well, that was very well said aj <laughs> you, you wrapped it all up really nicely <laughs> thank you now action tribe as you head out on your journey maybe you attend workshops you read books you take courses or you listen to podcasts you're bound to meet people from different stages in your journey right people who are absolutely new to the space or people who have practiced this path for the last 20 years or more at such a moment it's really easy to start comparing yourself with them your success with them your growth with them maybe your healing capabilities with theirs and once that starts that spiral never ends so remember that we're all heading towards the same point but we're really moving from different points in different directions and no two experiences are alike so don't let anyone's experience overwhelm you and when you find yourself wondering what to do next or how to find your life's calling remember the words of saint francis of assisi who once said start by doing what's necessary then do what is possible and suddenly you are doing the impossible so andrea as of right now what is your life's purpose my life's purpose is to share ancient wisdom with modern people, to bring back some of the ancient traditions that we've lost or have been destroyed, and to start sharing them with modern people because uh, I think that now they need it more than ever, especially with all the tumultuous stuff that's going on in the planet. So as long as I'm here, I'm going to keep sharing and keep uh, expanding and sharing knowledge and sharing truth. To the best of my ability. Now, as you look back at your life, your practice, the books that you've read, or any spiritual experience that you've had, was there ever a defining moment that changed your life? Yeah, actually, there was a defining moment. I was, um, when I was first healing my condition, I was working at MTV Networks, and uh, I was surrounded by noise constantly, music mm -hmm. coming out of every office. And I was feeling this need for a different type of not noise, but I was feeling the need to shut everything out, AJ. And I would come home and I would look at the TV that was in the corner of the room and I said, I got to get rid of my TV. And so I did. I, I got the TV and I got rid of it. My boyfriend at the time was so angry at me and he said, he said, why on earth are you getting rid of your TV? I said, because I need some silence. And if the TV's there, I'm going to turn it on. <laughs> and I, yeah. I just need silence. And what I was craving, AJ, was meditation. I was craving an internal silence because I was surrounded by so much noise. I, li I live in New York City and there was noise everywhere. And even at the office where I worked, it was all noise. And I couldn't hear my internal thoughts and I couldn't hear my deeper wisdom. And so I took a year, AJ, of complete silence. Uh, no radio, no television, no music. And I would come home and I would sit and I would meditate every single day. And that year of silence brought me so much clarity and understanding of my own, uh, my own condition as well as my purpose on the planet. And I would highly recommend for people to really tap into their own internal wisdom because inside of all of us is our own truth. And you don't want to get to the end of your life and say, my gosh, <laughs> you know, what was I doing here? It would be nice to get to the end and go, okay, 
This was a very cool journey. I loved my experience as a human being, and now I'm done with this, right? And you're you're out of here. So for me, that pivotal experience uh, was learning how to access the deeper wisdom that lives inside. So quick question here. When you were craving for more meditation and when you wanted to take your TV out of your home, how deep into your meditation practice were you? Were you already doing a lot of meditation or had you just stumbled upon that path? Uh, I had stumbled upon the path because um, I, I used to, it was it was like something that just naturally started to happen when I started to mm. clean up my diet. I, I was getting this feeling that there was something else that my body needed to eat besides food. And um, I know it sounds weird to think of like meditation as food, but it was total, it was food for my spiritual body. And um, a friend of mine, because I said to a friend of mine at MTV, I was like, man, I'm just, I, there's so much noise around me. I said, well, I, I, how do I get rid of all this noise? And he handed me a book by a monk called Peace is Every Step by Thich Nhat Hanh. And mm-hmm. um And he said, here, try reading this book. And I read that book and I was like, oh my gosh, this is what I'm looking for. I'm looking for silence, internal silence. And I read that book and I've been recommending it to people for 20 years (laughs) because it was like so easy to learn how to meditate, like learn how to meditate when you're walking, when you're sitting, you do the dishes. It could be a form of meditation. And um, it wasn't like just about sitting and meditating, although that that I, I think is really important as well. It was about making every day of every moment that you hear a form of meditation uh, so i really like that book it was great so thanks a lot for sharing and with that we have arrived at the very last round for today the rapid fire round called the wisdom round now these are four questions to ignite that action taking capacity in our listeners so what is the best advice that someone's ever given you to love myself name a personal habit that keeps you going Every day I get up and I do my morning met stretches and my morning meditation. So I think that beautifully ties into my next question, which is what is your morning routine like? What do you do during the first two hours of your day? I get up, I journal a little bit, I meditate, I stretch. I really get in, uh, in touch with me. Mm-hmm. Well, thanks a lot for that. Name a book that you'd like to recommend for our listeners today. Uh, Well, I already mentioned one, but I'll mention another one that's pretty good. You Can Heal Your Life by Louise Hay. Okay. We'll have that up in the show notes for sure so that our listeners can have access to the link and, you know, purchase that book if required. Our listeners really, really love the book recommendations. So Action Tribe for today's show notes, visit my 7 com forward slash 173. That's my 7 forward slash 173. Uh, So, Andrea, once again, thanks a lot for coming on our show, sharing your authentic stories and talking to us about such an important concept in life, nutrition, what to eat and what to definitely stay away from and how to change our lifestyle so that we can be more closer to our ancestors and learn how they conserve their energy throughout the day. Before you go, tell us one thing that you are grateful for and tell us the best way we can find you online. I'm grateful for today, AJ. Every day that I have another chance to be on the planet, I'm grateful. So I'm grateful for today. And your listeners can find me at www.andreabeeman.com. That's my website. (laughs) Wonderful. We'll have that link up in the show notes. Definitely Action Tribe. If you listen so far, that means you really want to change your life. You want to transform your life by taking one step at a time. And what better step to take than to assess and analyze what you're having on a day-to-day basis, whether it's breakfast, lunch, or dinner, and making small tweaks. You don't have to change everything at once, but just make small tweaks in order to get more nutrition out of your food and also try to adopt Uh, practices like meditation so that you can have that spiritual food that is so much needed throughout the day. So Andrea, thank you so much for joining us on today's show, talking to us about the healing power of food and also taking us one step closer to a human revolution. Thanks for having me, AJ. You are listening to My 7 Chakras. Go to mysevenchakras.com. Download your free gift, get inspired, and take action. Transform your life today.